Hello everyone, I'm Jacob Kauf and I'm the Nerd on the Street and today we are getting started with Blender. Alright everybody, so a few years ago I decided I wanted to start making animations and since I do all of my work on free and open source software, my obvious choice for an animation program was Blender. So I spent several years doing tutorials online about Blender, then I spent another year or so working on a production that hasn't even premiered yet. And even after all of that, I'm still no expert at Blender. There are a lot of things about Blender I don't know. I'm very much an amateur. However, I do know a lot more about Blender now than I did when I started. You can kind of tell because the intro that you just saw at the beginning of this video looks a lot better than the intro that was on my videos three or four years ago, and that intro was made in Blender. Like I said, I am working on a production in Blender right now, and that includes lots of very complicated materials and rigging and animation, but even just that intro at the beginning of every single one of my videos that you see, it took me a long time to just learn how to do that. For a long time, I didn't even know how to change the color of things in Blender. And if you're just opening up Blender for the first time, you might not even know how to move things around. I remember my first time opening Blender up, I did not know what was going on with the interface, because the interface is not intuitive at all. I'll just be honest, there was no way I was going to figure out how to use Blender without looking up other videos about it. So knowing how difficult it was for me to learn Blender, even though I'm not an expert in it, I kind of wanted to make a getting started video for new people opening up Blender for the first time. If you've never used Blender before, you can get it for free at blender.org. And it is a really a huge program that does a lot of different things. So even if you're not making an animation right now, I would highly recommend downloading it and just giving it a try, just so you know how to use the interface. You never know when it'll come in handy. So that's what we're doing in this video, and I'm gonna go ahead and cut to the desktop. All right, and here we are on the desktop. So we'll go ahead and open up Blender. And when you first open it up, this is the splash screen you will get. The image in the splash screen changes based on what version you have, and you can see I'm making this video with version 2.79b. At the bottom right of the splash screen, you've got recent files that you've opened up, and you've got an option to recover your last session. Whenever you quit Blender, if it quits successfully, it actually saves a temp file on your system called quit.blend. That temporary file is located in slash temp by default, and it's actually very handy to have that because Blender does not always prompt you if you want to save or not when you click the X button at the top right of your window. More on that later. So to get rid of the splash screen, you can click anywhere in the window, basically. That splash screen will go away. And if this is the first time that you're in Blender, the first thing you're probably going to notice is that clicking on this cube and trying to drag it around really doesn't do much. And clicking anywhere in this entire 3D view that we have, all that it does is move around this little crosshair on our screen. So what's going on? Well, the left click button on your mouse in Blender by default, all of that does is it sets the location of our 3D cursor. And that will come in handy later, but it does beg the question, well, how do we move things around? You can select different objects and move them around with your right mouse button. Here in our default Blender scene, we have three objects. We've got a cube, a camera up here, and then this is a lamp over here. And we can see those three objects listed actually in the top right of our window. This is the outline view for our file, and it lists everything in our file here. So like I just said, we've got a cube, a camera, and a lamp. So to select those different things, like I said, just right click on them. You can see whatever you have selected becomes orange. And also over in your outliner, it will be highlighted as well. Now to move our cube around, we actually can use the left mouse button if we click on one of these arrows. As you can see, we've got our x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis. The bottom left corner of our 3D view has this nice little representation of those just to orient yourself if you need to. So if we left click on this cube on one of the arrows, we can click and drag and that will let us move the cube around only on the arrow that we click. So I clicked the red x-axis arrow with my left mouse button. Now I can only drag it on the x-axis. Similarly, if I click on the green y-axis arrow, now I can only drag it on the y-axis. If we want to move this around more freely, we can click and drag with our right mouse button. So if we click with our right mouse button and start dragging, we have picked the cube up. At this point, you can actually let go of your right mouse button and you will continue dragging the cube around. Now this isn't actually as useful as it might seem because let's say I wanna throw this cube farther back in our view. Uh, I can't really do that. As you can see, it's just kind of moving up. 
because when you start dragging around objects with the right mouse button, it's just going to drag the object around basically relative to however you're viewing this scene, relative to your perspective. So I can move this left, right, up, and down right now. I can't really send it any further back right now though and I can't bring it any closer to me either. But if I do want to set the cube down somewhere, you actually have to left click to set the cube wherever you've placed it. If you start dragging with your right click button and you right click again, it's just going to pop back. That's like canceling your action there. Now it's possible to be a lot more precise with where you're setting things in Blender by using our, our properties panel. And you can open up the properties panel by pressing in on your keyboard or you can come up to the right, top right of your screen here and this little plus button, that opens up your properties panel as well. So the properties panel is going to give us properties on whatever object we have selected and those properties include the location, the rotation, the scale, the dimensions, and the scale and dimensions are different. We'll get into that a while later. But to start with, like I was just saying, you can adjust the location of our cube here with these location boxes. You can either type a number in if we want to set this to X1 or X2. You can see it's moving it along the red X axis. So closer to us is gonna be higher up. In addition to typing in numbers, you can also click and drag within this text box. And if you want to drag it slower, you can hold down shift and that'll be more of a, a fine grained movement. If you hold down control while you're sliding back and forth in that text box, my left mouse button is held down right now. After I clicked in that text box, holding down control will only step up in increments of whole numbers. Control and shift will slow down the increments, so control shift goes by the tenth location in our decimals. So using those boxes, we can adjust the location of our cube very easily, moving it around wherever we want it. We can also adjust the rotation. Now you can rotate objects by selecting them and moving around their values in our properties panel here, or we can just type R for rotate. Now if we type R, by default, once again, it's just going to rotate based on how we're looking at this object. If we want to rotate around a specific axis, we can type R, X for the X axis. And now we'll just rotate around the X axis. No matter where you move your mouse, it's only going to go around that one axis. Control Z does work to undo actions in Blender. And the first thing that I usually do when I've got a new Blender installation is actually turn up the number of things that Blender saves for me to control Z backwards with. So that's a great reason for us to go to our user preferences right now and check out a couple things. If you go up to the top left of your window, go to file, user preferences is right down here. You can access them also by typing control alt U and here are our user preferences. So by default, you'll probably be placed into the interface section of this. You can change the scaling of your window if you're on a high DPI display or something in this text box right here. And there are various sections of our settings uh, that you can go through. You've, you've got add-ons, you can add or remove. Some of them are enabled by default. You can apply different themes for Blender or customize the default theme to make it look different. Uh, you've got your different file locations. And finally, a system section of our user preferences. There are some important things in all of these sections, but right now we're looking at our undo amount. So if you go over to editing, at the bottom left here, we've got global undo enabled. And underneath that, we've got the amount of steps that we can undo. So this is the amount of times you can type control Z before it just says there's nothing left to undo. The default is 32. I'm gonna set this up to 100 because sometimes I just go off working on something, not realizing that I'm really doing something majorly wrong and then I have to undo a bunch later. Now at this point, if we X out of this window, that option will take effect for the rest of our session here in Blender. You can see it did save our value of 100. But if you want that option to actually save for the next time you quit Blender and open it up again, you have to click Save User Settings down here in the bottom left. And that will make it so that these settings are the same the next time you open up Blender. So we'll close out of User Preferences for now. Uh, like I said, R is the keyboard shortcut to rotate objects. If we want to move them around, another way we can do that is by pressing G for Grab and now we can move objects around. Once again, while I've got this object picked up, I can type X to lock it to the X axis, Y to lock it to the Y axis, Z to lock it to the Z axis. Now let's say that we rotate this object uh, on our X axis 90 degrees. Well, that didn't do much, did it? Let's undo that. Let's rotate it on the X axis 45 degrees. That's more visible, okay. Now if I type G and I grab this object and I want to move it along the Y axis, 
When I type Y the first time, you can see we're moving it left and right along the global Y axis. This is the axis that is shown at the bottom left of our window. It's shown in our, our default grid here. This is the Y axis that is file wide. But let's say I didn't actually want to move it along the Y axis globally. I wanted to move it along that object's Y axis. Remember, I've already rotated that object. So at this point, let's say I wanted to move the cube the direction that it's facing. If you type Y a second time, then you start moving along the object's local Y axis. And then if you type Y a third time, it gets rid of that and you're back to just moving it around. So you can use that with any direction. Z axis, it's gonna be global. Hit Z again, now it's the local Z axis. That is very useful to know. Now, so far we're looking at these objects, but we haven't figured out how to move our view around yet. There's a camera over here, but we're not looking through that camera. So if I want to look at the back of this cube right now, but I don't actually want to rotate it around the Z axis like this, if I want to just look at it from the other side, we can move our view around by using the middle mouse button, which is probably going to be a scroll bar on your mouse. Click and hold your scroll bar or your middle mouse button and drag your mouse. If you're holding your middle mouse button, button three on your mouse, then you will move the entire view around and you'll see when you're doing it sort of how it feels to to push the whole view there's two different ways we can set blender up to uh to move the view around when we're using the middle mouse button under our user preferences those two different ways are going to be under input um down here orbit style we've got turntable or trackball if we use trackball uh we can see if i take my middle mouse button hold it down and then move this uh, straight down, it's going to sort of see we're tilting the entire view, um, and that's a lot easier to, to get our view tilted, but it is more difficult just to move left and right normally. So that's why the default in Blender is going to be the turntable orbit style, which is much easier to just turn left and right, up and down. But sometimes I find myself switching between those based on the scene that I'm working in. So it's good to know that that option exists. All right, so it's really easy to get your view all kinds of messed up when you're holding down your middle mouse button. Um, so let's say that we've got a really weird rotation angle that we're looking through right now. And by the way, we can slide our view without rotating by holding down shift while we're using the middle mouse button. Now we're just moving whatever direction we move the mouse. You'll see Blender does capture your mouse cursor. So even if you run out of space on the screen, you can continue moving your mouse as long as you have physical space to do so. Blender will just keep wrapping your mouse cursor around while you're holding down a button in Blender. But yes, if you hold down shift while you're using your middle mouse button, we can pan and then uh, rotating is without shift. But let's say we want to set our view back to something rational. Like I, I don't know what degree I've got this rotated to right now, our view, but I just want to look at the cube straight on. For this, we're going to need the number pad on our keyboard. So this is another thing. The two things that make Blender really hard to use on a laptop are the reliance on our middle mouse button and our reliance on our number pad on our keyboard. So you're going to need a keyboard with a number pad to use Blender effectively, efficiently. And if you type the one on your number pad, it's going to bring us to our front view. Three on our number pad brings us to our right view. Seven brings us to our top view. And you can get to the other three views by holding down control while you type those. So control one goes to back view, control three goes to left view, and control seven is bottom. Now you'll see at the top left, it says what view we're in, bottom perspective, uh, back perspective, front perspective. Now it doesn't just say the word perspective for fun, you actually aren't always in perspective mode. If you type the five on your number pad, you switch from perspective to orthographic. And the difference between those, if you've ever taken a, an engineering or mechanical drawing class, you might know. In perspective view, things are drawn so that we have a horizon and lines that should be straight are going to naturally point toward those horizons. Now the effect of this is that we can be looking at an object basically straight on and it's going to, to look a little strange. Um, look how much we have to turn this cube um, before we can see one of the sides. We can see the right side here and now we can no longer see the right side. 
and we, we turn so far before we start seeing the left side. Now this is the way that our eyes work, because we have two of them and we see the world in 3D, but mathematically this doesn't make a lot of sense, so when you're building things in Blender, it can be really useful to look at them in orthographic view. If we switch to that, you can see we've got the right side of our cube, and we're moving, we're moving, and as soon as we can no longer see the right side, just about immediately after we start seeing the left side. So especially when you're looking in front view or top view, orthographic view is going to be much more accurate when you're comparing the sizes of different objects. So when you're building things or you're modeling in Blender, you're probably going to be using orthographic view a lot. Of course, it is always helpful to switch to perspective view every now and then because cameras in Blender usually render in perspective view. You can make cameras in orthographic view, and you can render orthographically for some certain situations, such as if you're making uh, graphics for a video, or if you're making 2D animations in Blender, you can set things to orthographic to make it easier for yourself. But if you're making 3D animation, you're probably going to want your cameras to be in perspective mode, because like I said, that's how people see naturally. Okay, so about this camera, how do we use that thing? If we go up to the top left of our window right now and we click render, render image, it's going to render from the view of our camera. And by the way, now we can click on this image and click the escape key to get back to our 3D view. Or after we've rendered, we can go down to the bottom left and change from the UV image editor view to our 3D view to get back here. But we see that our camera is giving us our rendered image, but how do we actually, how do we adjust that? How do we move the camera around and point to where we want to? Clicking the zero on your number pad will bring you into camera perspective. Right now we're looking through our camera at the cube, and if we render, you'll see that's the exact angle that we get looking through our camera when we render. Um, so when we want to move our camera around, we can do all the same things I was talking about before. Well, the first thing we have to do is select the camera. So we can left click it in our outline view over here actually to select it. And when we're in camera view, our outline is going to be orange to signify that we have that selected. We can use our transform tools in our properties panel to move the camera around. And if we do that, um, we'll see that it reflects in our render. But that's not very natural. That's hardly ever how I actually adjust the camera. The way that I do it is in the properties panel when we have a camera selected, we've got this option here called lock camera to view. If you check that, you get a red dotted outline around your camera to warn you and remind you that this is turned on. And now we can move around using the same middle mouse click mechanics as when we're not in a camera, you know, using the middle mouse button moving things around like this. By the way, you can zoom in and out by scrolling on your middle mouse button. Zooming in is scrolling up, scrolling down zooms out. If we go into our camera, we can use all of those same things to move our camera around when this option lock camera to view is turned on. So now, now we can middle click and drag to move our camera around. We can zoom out. And this is actually moving the camera around in the world. You can see now the camera's in a different location than it was before, but it's way easier, I find, to set camera shots up where we actually want them when we've got that enabled. Now, right now we're looking through our camera, but we've got all this border on the outside that we don't really need. Right now, scrolling up and down is going to zoom our camera in and out. If we uncheck that box for a second, we can scroll up to zoom in on our camera perspective. Now, if we check that box again, we can continue scrolling to continue adjusting our camera. So I find that's really, really helpful when you're figuring out where you want to put your camera, and that's how I normally move the camera around. And then I keyframe it when I get it where I want it, which I don't think we're going to go into animation or keyframing in this video. That'll be a different one. This is just basic navigation stuff we're talking about right now. But now we've got our camera in another position. We can render, and you can see that the light is all coming from one location. The rest of this cube is black because all of the light is coming from one direction and that direction is where our lamp is in here. Now just a couple more keyboard shortcuts to leave you guys with if you want to continue experimenting with Blender. Shift D duplicates objects. So now I've created a duplicate lamp. We're going to change the type of the second lamp if we go into our properties pane way over here. So I guess this is actually called the Properties Pane. I don't know what this thing's actually called that I've been calling the Properties Pane, but the Properties Pane all the way on the right side, the bottom right of our window. We've got Render Options here, we've got World Options, and we've got 
depending on what type of object you have selected, we've got contextual options where we can edit data for our currently selected objects. So since we have a lamp selected right now, uh, this data icon is going to be a little lamp or a sun. So if we click on that, we can see different types of lamps that we can use. We'll go with the spotlight right now just because it's easy to see what it's doing. And I want to rotate this lamp. I actually want to rotate it along the x-axis and the y-axis, but not the z-axis. Uh, so how do I do that? You can actually type R to rotate, shift Z, and now we'll rotate just along X and Y. So now that thing is pointing elsewhere. You can also do that with moving things around. If I type G for grab, once again, if I type shift X, it's going to move along everything that's not the X axis. So that's Z and Y. So we'll set that up where the spotlight is clearly pointed at our cube. We'll go back into camera view to see what that's going to look like in terms of our lighting. It looks okay. We're gonna go ahead and try rendering that out. Okay, and the, the light's still not hitting those sides of our cube right there. So we'll move this thing down a bit. Let's rotate it up. And ah, we've got to move it to the side here. All right, so that should do a little bit better here. Now let's try it. Render image. OK, so now we've got a little bit of light on the other sides of our cubes there. Uh, I can actually make this new light that we added a lot brighter by increasing the energy here in the data section of our properties panel. Now if we render it out, you can see it's a lot brighter on those other sides. All right, so that's a lot of information I just dropped right there, especially toward the end, sped up a whole lot. I don't wanna to get too far into it in this video since this was just a getting started. I just wanted to show you how to move things around because it took me a while. I, I was completely lost when I first opened up this program. I had no idea how to do anything that I just did here. I do just wanna show you a couple more things. If we click anywhere to set the location of our 3D cursor and then we do Shift A, that's how we add more objects. So now we can add another cube or we can add a sphere. Let's add a cone for our example here and we'll move that cone near our cube. All right, and then we'll, we'll move our camera so that we can see both of these things. Uh, and now if we render, we can see what that looks like. You can see the cone is casting a little bit of a shadow onto the cube there. The last thing I wanna show you is how to change the colors of objects. Now this is going to be different a little bit based on if you're using the Blender internal rendering engine or if you're using the Cycles rendering engine or any other rendering engine because you can actually plug other ones into Blender as well. I'm actually using Cycles for the production that I'm working on right now, but for the intro you saw at the beginning of this video, I was using Blender Internal Render. So when you've got Blender Render selected, which is the default Blender rendering engine, when you have an object selected that you can change the color of, these are called mesh objects by the way, we can come over to our properties panel and we've got two options here, two sections called material and texture. Material is where we're going to set our color. Texture is if you want to apply an image to an object, which is very handy to do. You might have a picture of concrete texture that you want to apply to a surface to make that surface look like uh, the ground outside. Um, so you would apply that under the, the texture area. But we're going to go to material. We'll click new, and that's going to add a slot for us, and it's going to add a material in that slot. The default type of material is just a really basic diffuse material, and we can set our diffuse color by clicking in this color palette right here. The, I did not know how to do this for so long. If you go and look at older Nerd in the Street videos, the words were always gray because I didn't know how to set the color of the words. Uh, but you can do that by changing the diffuse color right here. You've got a CYMK wheel. Well, this, this is an RGB listing here, but you can drag around to whatever color you want, you know, uh, set your hue, set your lightness. You can set that with RGB, hue saturation value, or with a hex code if you're a web developer and you're used to using CSS colors. So you can set those however you want. We'll do that for the cube as well. We'll make that one green. The specular color is going to be the color that light reflects off of your object. Um, we're going to leave it white for now because our lamp is also, it, our lamp is projecting white light. Um, so just for simplicity's sake, we're going to leave the specular also set to white so that things look like they make sense a little bit. And there's all kinds of stuff. I could make a whole video about just materials in Blender Render and then I could make a whole separate video about materials and cycles. 
I can make a whole series about materials and cycles actually, but now that we've got some colors, let's render that out and see what that looks like. You can see we've set the colors of things. So that's how the Nerd in the Street intro got colors, was I learned how to do what I just showed you how to do. And I added the text for the Nerd of the Street intros. If we type zero to get out of our camera view, we're gonna click on to this cube to set the location of our 3D cursor so that the text I'm about to add goes there and I don't have to move it around a bunch. If we type shift A, like I said, these are mesh objects we've been working with. We can also add a text object. If you type the period on your number pad key, it actually zooms your view into whatever you have selected. Um, and at this point, we'll move this thing a little bit period again to zoom in. And typing tab when you have anything selected goes into edit mode. So if I have my cube selected and I type tab, it goes into edit mode. Now you can see the little vertices on each corner of the cube and we can actually go and select those and move them around and that's how we start to kind of make different shaped objects that aren't just cubes and cones. That's getting a little beyond the scope of our video here, but if I go to my text and I type tab, I can edit the text. So we can make that say nerd on the street. I'll just keep typing even though it went out of our view there. I'm gonna grab our camera with zero, go into camera view, we'll move this around so that we can see that text. And I'm actually realizing just now how much more complicated this actually was than I even consider it normally just because I'm so used to doing this. Right now this, this text is flat, there's no depth to it at all because it's just text. There are several different ways we can add depth to it. One of those ways is in our properties panel over here, we can go to the modifiers section, click on add modifier, and there's a modifier called solidify right here. And if we apply that, we can see we are starting to have some depth. When that's turned off, there's no depth. When we turn it on, we can set a thickness for this text. That's just one way to do it. We could also get rid of that modifier and we can, we can actually type alt C to convert this, this text to uh, mesh. You can see here it says mesh from curve meta surface or text. So we can click that. Now this turns into a mesh. Now we can go into edit mode. If you type A, it selects everything. So if we type A when we're not in edit mode, when we're in object mode, typing A will select or deselect all the objects in our scene. If we are in edit mode, typing A will just select all the vertices or deselect all the vertices in that object. Now we can type E to extrude. It's going to default extrude out of the surface that we've got, which is what we want. We can bring that up however far we want it. Left click to set that. Uh, now type tab again, and now our text has some depth to it also. So now we can go into the same place we did for our cube and cone over there, into the material section, click new, set a color here, make it blue for Nerd on the Street, all right. Now if we go into our camera, let's see what this looks like. All right, hey, look at that. Nothing like the intro at the beginning of this video, but like I said, these are the building blocks that I used to get there. And you know, I actually feel like I'm dropping way too much information, like way too quickly right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the video here. That's just a taste of Blender. That's how to, how to get started with it. Uh, there's a lot more stuff that just even popped into my head while I was saying all of that that I could tell you about how to use this program, but I'll just leave it at that for now. So you guys let me know in the comments down below if there's anything specific you want to know how to do, any specific questions you have about all of this. I just wanted to try out making a video about Blender because I use Blender really often right now, but I haven't talked about it on camera before. So I hope that was useful to you guys. Let me know whether or not uh, you learned anything here if you've, if you've never used Blender before. Obviously, if you've opened Blender up before and you've gone through some tutorials, nothing that I just said to you was new. But if you've never used it before, hopefully this video will help you get started with it a little bit easier than when I had to get started with it and I was scrambling trying to figure out how to, how to move that default cube around. So that's all for this video, and I will be back with another one if you guys liked this. For now, oh, I'll go ahead and save this file with Control S, and you gotta be careful here because Blender does not save you from yourself at all. Uh, so I'm gonna make a new folder and call it Blender Tutorials, and we'll make this file called episode1.blend. Now, be really careful because if you type in the name of a file that is already in use, Blender will just overwrite. It will not ask you would you like to overwrite this? It will just do it. So be careful. It will highlight your text box here red, 
uh, but if you don't notice that it's highlighted red and you just click save, then it will just overwrite whatever was there before. But we'll go ahead and click save, and I'm going to sign off now. I'm Jacob Kaufman with Nerd on the Street. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.